that learned to fly with the Italian Air Force during World War One. They flew in these open cockpit uh, planes, prime motor Caproni bombers, and uh, it was very cold flying these missions over the uh, Italian Alps. And on one particular mission, and you see here, here the um, aviators had to bundle up to ward off the cold. One particular mission, he contracted a case of pneumonia. Looked like he'd recovered. He came back to America, uh, went about his life, a year and a half passed. But in the summer of 1920, a relapse set in. And despite the best medical care, the Watchwoods could provide for their son, young Emory U. of Watchwoods died at age 25 in 1920. Devastated by the loss of their only child, the Watchwoods thought an appropriate way to honor the young boy's memory would be to build a Lincoln Memorial in his honor in their winter home of Redlands, California. Uh, that dream became a reality in 1932, 84 years ago, when Mr. Watchorn dipped into his own pocket to the tune of $60,000 and built this original eight-sided octagon you see here on the slide. Uh, fountains were added in 1937 to the east and west of the facility, and a flagpole, much needed, was finally added in 1944 during the midst of World War II, the same year that Robert Watchorn passed away as well. This is the way the shrine looked for those of you who have been there in, uh, prior to the the 1990s, the way it looked from all the way from 1937 onward, and it was only a thousand square feet. More material, more material continued to come in. So as a result, in the 1990s, uh, we expanded the facility in 1998, tripling the size of the institution and allowing more material about Lincoln and the American Civil War to be displayed. Included in the collection is things ranging from an original marble bust of Lincoln by the American sculptor George Gray Barnard and probably the most prized piece in the entire collection that's on display uh, right now, as a matter of fact, is an original Norman Rockwell painting entitled Thoughts on Peace on Lincoln's Birthday, showing a World War II soldier reading a book about Lincoln and seeking inspiration from Lincoln's life and times. Uh, so if you have not been to our facility, and a handful of you who are not, I commend it to your attention. If you're interested enough to uh, come here and hear my humble remarks this evening, you're certainly going to be much more impressed with what we have to display on Lincoln Memorial Shrine. One of the things I, I wanted to point out, uh, first of all, is the effect that the presidency had on Abraham Lincoln. The image on the left is from 1861 when he was inaugurated, and then you see four years later, he's aged massively in the, in the course of four years. I think we've seen that with some of our, our presidents in current times, either uh, George W. Bush or, or President Obama, have definitely aged over the course of their eight years in the office. The strains of the office definitely take a, a wear and tear on, uh, on any man. Uh, there are some who've uh, speculated that Lincoln may have been suffering from cancer in the last year of his life. Uh, I haven't seen conclusive e evidence on that. Others have speculated that he was suffering from what we call Marfan syndrome, uh, which uh, in a lot of cases leads to pre premature death, uh, and uh, so perhaps he might not have lived too much longer than he did in, a, in, in 1865. But there were other attempts against Abraham Lincoln's life. He even had a file in the White House, his White House desk, labeled assassination. Uh, because there were so many uh, efforts against him. Uh, one Alabama man put up a million dollar reward if someone would kill Abraham Lincoln, and it didn't, that didn't take place. But there were a series of kidnap plots as well. Perhaps the most famous occurred in Baltimore, Maryland in 1861 when he was on his way to Washington to be inaugurated. The uh, perpetrator of the, uh, I lost that slide there, excuse me, here we go. The perpetrator of the, of the plot was on the left, a gentleman by the name of Cipriani Ferrandini, he was a hairdresser at the Barnum Hotel in downtown Baltimore, and he was part of an organization known as the Knights of the Golden Circle. And these were uh, primarily Democrats who were opposed to the Republican plans about uh, limiting the expansion of slavery, and um, were dramatically opposed to Maryland uh, leaving the, you know, me, staying in the Union and supporting the Unionist cause. So they came up with a plot that was going to kidnap Abraham Lincoln and uh, take him away before he got He operated at Ford House in Washington, D.C., not too far from Ford's Theater. Uh, the house is, by the way, is in existence today, if you ever get to Washington, D.C. It's currently a Chinese restaurant, uh, but it is in existence. Um, Mary Surratt had a series of borders at the house, and amongst those borders were people that would become involved in John Wilkes Booth's assassination slash kidnapping plot. Uh, as you see the quote here, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton uh, would later claim that Mary Surratt kept the nets that hatched the egg that was the assassination plot. Um, she would be convicted of being involved in the assassination and would be executed, uh, sentenced to death by hanging, and she would become the first woman ever executed by the federal government. There are still people today, by the way, trying to exonerate her name, the Mary Surratt Society, and claim that she did uh, not deserve to die for her role in uh, the assassination. All right. 
Then we turn to the, the man on the left there, we all recognize John Wilkes Booth. Uh, what we probably don't remember uh, is how famous he was in 19, uh, 18, 1865. He was only 26 years old, and uh, he was already established a reputation as one of the finest actors in America. He came from the famous Booth family of actors. His father, Junius, and his brother, uh, Ed, um, Edmund, excuse me, were highly regarded Shakespearean actors and were well regarded throughout the nation. There's even a theater in New York that was named after the Booth family. The image on the right, by the way, um, right over here, uh, anybody recognize where that is by any chance? Yeah, you know where it is. Yeah, Springfield, Illinois. Now, there, there, those of us in the historical community have, uh, have a big problem with this. This is at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library in Springfield. There are full-size um, wax, it, it's not made out of wax, it's some sort of acrylic uh, material. But it's full-size figures of Lincoln, his family, some of the famous people of that time, Frederick Douglass, Secretary of uh, State Seward, and others. But they elected, the uh, curators there elected to put in a full-size wax figure of John Wilkes Booth. And there are those of us who feel that this is inappropriate and why should they be honoring the assassin of uh, one of the greatest Americans to ever live at the Lincoln Presidential Library. You wouldn't see a you know, Lee Harvey Oswald figure at the John F. Kennedy Library. And the southern states seceded from the nation and uh, were quickly joined up to the firing on Fort Sumter, Sumter by five more. And the worst war in American history broke out four years long, and at least 626,000 Americans died during this conflict. The reason I say at least, there's new scholarship out there that uh, I think is very compelling by looking at the census records from 1860 and comparing them with 1870. But the figure may be as much as 750,000 Americans have died in this conflict. Now, again, by way of comparison, 440,000 died in, in World War II, Americans that is. You put all the rest of America's wars together, it'll barely get to that 700,000 figure. So uh, the American Civil War was a disaster uh, for many families in our nation. Remember, we only had 40 million people living in the United States in 1860 versus uh, 300 million plus today. Uh, so it was a major catastrophe that it impacted uh, the country as a whole, and also you know, puffed up his chest and said, we won this war. Instead, started turning towards uh, the problems of reconstruction, and also uh, broached for the first time the idea, the then very radical idea, of granting limited suffrage, limited rights to vote, to some African Americans. It was considered quite radical in 1865, and uh, again, he broached it for the first time in this famous speech on April 11, 1865. Included among the audience and for that speech were John Wilkes Booth and a friend, and the friend would later testify that this was uh, John Wilkes Booth's reaction. That means enter citizenship. Now, I won't repeat the word, but we put it up here to show how uh, uh, vicious that John Wilkes Booth could be. Now, by God, I'll put him through. That's the last speech going to ever play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Again, I'm sure many of you have been to Ford's Theater. It's been brilliantly re re restored, and uh, uh, it's, it's a great way to understand American history. Uh, but around noon that, that day, there was Miss Laura King. She was an extremely popular actress and excelled in the comic type of entertainment which our American cousin uh, demonstrated. Um, the plot of our American cousin is, is nothing to write home about. Uh, some theaters actually perform it and actually uh, have a, a gunshot that go off, goes off in the exact point in the play uh, when Lincoln uh, was shot. Uh, it's very silly by today's standards. The jokes are, really don't hold up. They're familiar with it. Uh, but and uh, he learned while picking up his mail on the morning of the 14th and Lincoln was scheduled to see the, the play that evening. So uh, he quickly uh, put into motion what had been a kidnap plot and turned it into an assassination plot. Around 8 p.m., as the play was already underway, Lincoln and his party arrived. The president, as usual, was running late. He entered the theater. The play actually stopped, and the band broke out in Hail to the Chief. A tired Lincoln bowed once and, and moved into box seven where he could watch the play with his wife. One Mary. lone actor will be on stage and will utter the best laugh line in the play, guaranteed to bring the house down the big applause line. This, at this moment, when the crowd began to laugh, would be the time that Booth planned to pull the trigger on his one-shot, single-shot Derringer pistol. All right, at 10.15 p.m., the actor on the left, Harry Hawk, began to uh, utter the key line, you old sockdologizing man trap. And the crowd began laughing as, they would, as he expected. And at that moment, a puff of blue smoke emanated from box seven at Ford's Theater, and the, where the president was sitting. The audience heard Mary Lincoln scream, they've killed him, they've killed him. All right, um, again, that single shot Derringer pistol entered Lincoln's uh, skull at the back of his, his head, and uh, this is a modern autopsy depiction of it. 
Uh, you can see the Derringer bullet traveled straight through, straight through Lincoln's brain and lodged just below and above, just before and above his left eye. Um, doctors today say that even if this wound had been taking place in a surgical hospital, it would have been mortal. That there's no way he would have su survived this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, devastating blow to the brain. All right, Booth had uh, put a wedge block um, barring the door uh, that entered into the, into the president's booth box. And so as a result, his only way out was over the, uh, the banister down 10 feet on, down onto the stage. As you can see here, his uh, spur on his boot caught the Treasury Department flag that was lining the president's box, causing him to land awkwardly. And the, the bell lost his balance, fell hard on his left heel, fracturing the tibia at the ankle. Who limped, limped across the stage and uh, wielding the knife in his hand. Actually, let me back this up here. Uh, you can see uh, Major Rathbone on the side there. Major Rathbone reacted to the shot and attempted to grab Jonathan's booth. Remember, it's a single shot Derringer. Booth had a very long knife in his hands and he stabbed a Rathbone in the shoulder, opening up a cut all the way down to the elbow. Uh, he bled profusely. Uh, a lot of the blood that would end up on the floor of the box and uh, later get on the clothes of several people in the box uh, would be Rathbone's blood. Uh, later in, in, uh, in history, people would claim it was Lincoln's blood. His wound uh, bled very little. So uh, Rathbone's uh, attempt to stop him was unsuccessful. So then jumping down upon the stage, Booth took out his, waved his knife at the audience. And you can imagine the shock and horror that's going on in a, in a theater uh, when all of a sudden the uh, play is interrupted and the scene takes place. Waves the bloody crowd, the bloody knife at the crowd and yells, Six Semper Tyrannus! Of course, is a Shakespearean Latin line meaning thus always the tyrants. It comes from Julius Caesar. Caesar. Booth, of course, felt that Lincoln was a tyrant and that he had uh, somehow acted in defense of freedom. That phrase, Six Center Tyrannus, by the way, is Virginia's state motto um, long before the, the assassination attempt, thus always the tyrants. All right, as the before the audience could react, uh, uh, Booth uh, exited Johnson. Remember, he had just been inaugurated himself about a month before. He was a new vice president. The man who was scheduled to uh, carry out this part of the plot is on the left there. His name was George Atzerodt. Most Americans seem to be German. Immigrant. Abraham Lincoln is uh, an example of the, the finest things that Americans can become. Um, through his own industry and intellect, he rose from a log cabin all the way up to the White House, guided our nation through our worst crisis, the American Civil War, and helped end the scourge of American slavery. So from institutions from our Lincoln Memorial in Redlands to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., uh, Lincoln is still revered by Americans and for people throughout the world. And it's a privilege to be concluding my 30th year at the Lincoln Memorial Shrine and, and helping bring the message of Abraham Lincoln to as many people as possible. So I thank you for your attention. This evening. For it, I think is equally important because it kind of sums up what the war was all about and, uh, and in fact is, is uh, telling the South that this war continues, that it's not going to turn out well, uh, it's in fact threatening the sword. Then he offers the olive branch and uh, the two couplets together I think need to be understood in their entirety. Mr. Mr. Lincoln, if you would please. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth 
compiled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. And until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Thank you very much. To the, uh, or Tad had gone to see Aladdin at his uh, lamp that night, and we had decided to go to Ford's Theater. And that morning, uh, I guess you could say tired and weary, uh, my, our eldest son, Robert, and General Grant had entered Washington, D.C. from a, a long and arduous train trip back from the battlefield. And then that morning, Mary and I had asked Robert if he could possibly join us with, to the, at the theater that night. And as tired as he was, he graciously declined. For many years after that, he was torn because he felt that if he could possibly have been in that presidential booth, and he would have been